to tell us uh, another like historical story um, with, with lots of bits of film sprinkled in. Um, and uh, we have a lot to, to film uh, from, from many uh, discoveries, many inventions, many observations, many insights and different things. And I put it to chain a few of those together. Uh, firstly, this is retrospective, but it's, it's pushing me a little bit further forward. Um, looking back, this is about comprehensions, they're a very familiar program presentation. Um, we, we know them from set theory, from this is a Danilo Frankel uh, axiom schema and specification of Wikimedia called it. Um, they've been in programming languages for a long time too. Uh, so there was a language called Settle uh, that came out of New York University, um, Jack Schwartz and others, a lot of people that has it was a language for manipulating uh, set expressions uh, and had set comprehensions in. Uh, they were uh, a cornerstone of what's known as the I movement point of finalization. So, Mike Stewart, Backhouse, and Co. used this as a vehicle for specifying programs. And uh, a, a many of uh, our favorite parts of programming languages as well. So, uh, with BRC and SASL and Miranda from Lady Turner. NPL, which new programming language, I think that stands for, and a language from John Dark and Poe, and of course, Haskell as well. So, comprehensions are a great way of expressing programs and manipulate collections. And uh, one of um, Phil's observations that I, I, I like very really much is that the, uh, the structure that you require of a data type in order to be able to use comprehensions on that is for it to be loaded. So this is going to be perhaps the first of many many tutorials over the world. Um, not, not just a monad, but a monad with zero. So the words will have some <laughs> comprehensions that have guards that you find this, this test for evenness. Then you need to know what to do with your collection when the guard fails. So you need something corresponding to an empty uh, computation and empty data structure. So I think the monad is zero. Four operators and uh, four numbers here. I'm not going to bother with this language, I'm going to trust them with this. Uh, so then there's a, a, a decoding transformation uh, that explains how to turn comprehensions uh, into applications of these monad operations. Uh, this uh, Phil explained in book with Simon Peyton Jones on implementing functional languages, I believe that chapter is Phil's chapter. Um, it's very really nicely explained how to compile uh, comprehensions uh, into operators. And so this means you can use comprehensions uh, for all sorts of monads as long as they're monads with zero. So lists, sets, bags, um, probability distributions as long as you allow for distributions with bits missing, sometimes called soft distributions. And uh, exceptions as well. The, 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 the one that exceptions is not going to be zero because nothing is going to be zero. Nothing is going to be zero. So, when we think of, of comprehensions, mostly for, for collection types like lists and sets and bags, um, so collection types are monads, they have monads with zero, as long as you have an empty collection. But monads with zero doesn't explain collections because there's no way of building um, a collection with two elements, given only the operations of the monad with zero, we need some way of uh, adding elements. Um, so uh, we need to use an arm operator, uh, and, and one operator you might choose to do this is a, is a binary choice kind of operator, a union kind of operator. So I'm going to introduce that operator as well, I'm going to be the fifth operator, and uh, one of the top four operators. Union operator that um, is coherent with the multiplication of the monad and the zero of the monad with these laws. So now things like sets and bags and lists and soft distributions are uh, collection monads and exceptions are not. Um, exceptions are not because the other thing that you would define of this type doesn't satisfy the, the programming rules. 
so, so many things are collections like supported to this, uh, as well as there's a distribution of a funding one, perhaps, but uh, there's a, a hierarchy of types called the Bone hierarchy uh, named after uh, Henry Bone, um, uh, where you, uh, you have a, an empty thing, you have a choice thing, um, and uh, some laws that the, the, the choice thing might or might not satisfy. So, with no laws, you get a kind of binary tree data type. So you find it by the tree because the empty tree is a unit of the constructor. Um, and then if you insist that the choice is associated with lists, if you insist that it's also used to get bags, you still insist that it's also uh, either of those in sets and we consider these types more the hierarchy of the rules. This is quite cute, but um uh, in Dutch, every bone is Dutch, bone in Dutch means tree. So, so. So let me tell you about um, aggregations too. So the aggregation operators for collections and those things like SOM, SOM, and SOM, uh, are the well-behaved operations over collections. Well-behaved in the sense that uh, these two laws are satisfied. If I have a singleton collection and aggregate it, I get the sum of that collection. And if I have a collection of collections, I can flatten it to a single collection and then aggregate it. Or I can aggregate each sub collection to get a subtotal and then aggregate the subtotals to get a total of those two things should be. Um, if you're a category theorist, you'll recognize these as being the algebras for the particular collection monad. Um, if you're a, a functional programmer of a certain age, you'll recognize these as being the reduction operators of uh, the data sources, for example. Um, let me back that up. Um, Given one of these well behaved aggregation operators H, I can define a binary operator upon collection elements, um, muscle, uh, which makes uh, a two element collection, makes a single element collection from A, makes a single element collection from B, unions them together to make a two element collection, and then aggregates that. Uh, so that's just a, that's combining the values of, of two elements. So if your aggregation is to sum the values of a collection of numbers, this is addition. Um, and there necessarily has to be a, a value called, I'm going to call it S, epsilon here, um, uh, which is the, the aggregation of the empty collection. Um, it follows from the well behaviorness of H that uh, um, if you aggregate a union of two collections, that's the sum of the aggregations of those two collections. That's the most surprising. Um, moreover, the, the plus one and the epsilon have to satisfy at least all the laws that the union and the empty collection do. So if, if, you, if your unions are associative, then your plusons are necessarily associative as well. So these are the reductions of uh, 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 Richard Burt's uh, uh, definition of manipulation calculus, the theory of lists, and they, they derive from APL. But they work not just with sequences. So now, there's another piece of history. Um, uh, Phil Wadler and Phil Prinder um, uh, argue way back in the early 90s for the use of comprehensions as a, a query notation. So this was the basis of Phil Prinder's PhD thesis. Um, so here's a little example. Suppose I have a, a collection of customers who have customer IDs and names and addresses, and I have a collection of invoices. They have invoice IDs, they're for a particular customer, so they have common key customer IDs. And each invoice has an amount and the due date. Then here's a little query that um, computes all the overdue invoices. I take all my customers, uh, C, I take all my invoices I, I keep only the overdue invoices so I can convert invoices that are the due date is less than today. And then I keep only the pairs of a customer and an invoice that match on customer ID. And for each of those, I construct a, a mailing label for a slotting letter that says your invoice is on. So this is, you can, you can see that the comprehension there is a little query language for collections. And because it's about comprehensions, it works not just for bags, it works for any, uh, any collection. And this was a very influential observation. Uh, Phil and Phil's, um, it, 
full of the thing, particularly with database programming languages can be used in so this game. There was a group of pen that might be familiar with uh, so that has a language called Plyv. Um, it's essentially what's a Microsoft language integrated query um, for your Eric Maya. It's also been uh, linked, which we've all got from here in this talk. It's a set of things that have it's also if you look if you if you look at it the right way, it's in uh, it's in query languages for objects, the OQL query languages for XML, it's an X query, that's another way of looking for this. So this idea that you can use comprehensions as a query notation is also very sweet. But that it has a problem. Uh, and the that the problem it has is that when you're doing relational database queries at least, uh, you depend crucially on doing relational joins and writing them as comprehensions in the style is a terrible way of doing joins. So if I take this overdue invoices query and I'll pack the syntactic sugar and de-sugar it, I get something like this, this program. The thing to note is the last line of that of those four lines. First thing you do is you take the Cartesian product of all the customers and all the invoices. And most of that is junk. Most of that is customer and invoice pairs that don't match. Scarlet in the second. So that's a little bit of an atrocious way of doing the overdue invoices. What you really want to do is, um, is in some sense, have indexes on the two tables. So you might want to index your customers by customer ID, index your invoices by customer ID. Now you have two tables with common index, and you can combine the matching customer IDs. So if you want to write something more like the program at the bottom of the slide. This has uh, two other operators, merge and index by. Uh, what index by does takes a collection and partitions it into collections and collections. By uh, the, the function is the first on and there. So we're indexing customers by their customer ID, and we're indexing invoices by their customer. And then what merge does is it takes two index tables with a common index and makes a table of pairs with the same index. And if you um, if you do that, then you, you have all the customers with a given ID, probably there's only one of them, and all the invoices with that ID, and then you can just do a, a localized Cartesian product um, for that little pair of collections. And you don't generate all the junk. This is the right way to do However, this does not correspond to anything that we can express in the language of comprehension. So it seems like you have to choose between uh, the neat syntax of comprehensions or the sensible implementation that you get by doing indexing and merging. But you have to choose. I'm going to show you you don't have to choose. That's the, that's the thing. So let me take you to another uh, ingredient. Again, it fulfills this time with time and uh, uh, Well, let me tell you first about. Um, <coughs> A simple variation, a simple extension to the notion of comprehensions that I, I believe was first introduced in between Remus Plasma's function uh, program. So here's a comprehension, but not with one vertical bar, but two vertical bars in it. So this is um, the x, y is where x is drawn from the, the list 1, 2, 3, and in parallel, y is drawn from the list 4, 5, 6. So if that second vertical bar were a comma, you'd get the Cartesian product with 3 times 3 pairs. The idea here is that you do those two integrations in parallel and you get only three pairs, one, four, two, five, and three, six. So this was introduced in uh, Clean and kind of rather quietly made its way into Haskell uh, in about 2000, I think. Uh, there was no fanfare about it, it just crept into GHC5 somehow. Uh, with Phil and Simon wrote this paper. Uh, Haskell Symposium in 2007 called Comprehensive Comprehensions, and they were taking um, uh, the, some of the things you can do in SQL queries and extending the comprehension notation to support those. So in SQL, you can also uh, have a select project and select where um, uh, query, and then you can also order by, so you can, you can sort, and you can also group by. That's how SQL gets a lot of its power from this grouping. So Phil and Simon uh, 
introduced a null extension for comprehension syntax that explained how to do uh, grouping in particular is the thing I want to about today. So you can write NGHC now, um, uh, this, this query. Um, so this, this, this example is from Phil Simon's paper where you have employees, um, a different table of employees that has the employee name, the employee department, and the employee salary. And what we're trying to work out here is um, the sum of the salaries of all the employees in each department. So we're going to group our, our employees by department and sum of the salaries of each group. As it happens, it also sorts by salary. So um, this is a, a very nice paper and it's a very nice um, extension. It's a rather funky uh, extension to the uh, Haskell syntax. Because it rebinds variables in the way that no other comprehension notation does. And I'm not going to explain the, the translation here, but perhaps you can see uh, in the second line of that comprehension where we, we draw from employees, we draw triples with the name of the department and the salary, and each of them's salary, and salary just gets bound to, to a sub numerator integer. So, um, what happens when you, so in, in, the, in the scope of the group by, so after the group by, so everything is in scope of the group by, which is everything that follows the group by, but also the term that precedes the vertical block by. Uh, the variable salary is rebound not to an integer, but to a collection of integers, a list of integers. So it rebinds name to a list of names, uh, department to a list of departments, and salary to a list of salaries. Uh, so in a sense, you've got uh, a, a sum for each subgroup of the table. You then work out the columns, all the names, all the departments, all the salaries. If you group by department, then all the departments should be the same. Um, and so there's a function of work there that takes a collection of values, a collection of equal values, and gives you the common value. Uh, and if you've got a collection of salaries, then you can do the sum of the salaries. So that's all I'm going to explain to you about this group by notation. Uh, it's, 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 it's rather odd. And it's rather unloved, I think. Um, uh, essentially, nobody uses this uh, except me. Yeah, so I'm very happy about that. A few years later, um, George Georgisa and Torsten Bust and Co. from uh, Tübingen um, showed how to generalize this group wise and the parallel uh, Z comprehensions, not from just lists. Which is lists for all you had in clean and lists for all you had in Phil and Simon's paper. They, they, they work for other monads too. So, just like we can generalize monad comprehensions to other monads and lists, we can generalize this parallel thing and we can generalize this grouping thing. Uh, and they work for the same for other monads and lists. Yeah, and they crucial ingredients are to have a, a Z like operator. No surprise there. It takes a collection of A's and a collection of B's and makes a collection of A, B, and A's. The intention is that that's supposed to be a zippy kind of thing, rather than not a zip product kind of thing. And group with, um, which is somewhat mysterious and I think somewhat un unsettled yet as to precisely how this should work out. Um, but uh, I'm going to say what group with does is it takes a, a T of A's, a collection of A's, and factors that. Uh, factors T into U after F. Now, this is not supposed to. Supposed to say in conjunction to you or three or anything. T is a monad, U is a monad, F is just a functor. So it, it, it splits a, a collection into some kind of collection of collections, and what I need is that the outer collection is a monad, the inner collection just needs to be a functor. Um, so in GHC, there is a type class called monad zip, of which M zip is the member function method, uh, and the, it should have this corresponding type. Um, in the, in George Edison paper in 2011, there was a monad group type class that had a, an end group with, whose type was TA to T of T of A, the T, uh, U, had, U had to be T, and F had to be T as well. Uh, it splits a list into a list of lists, a set into a set of sets, a bag into a bag of bags. Um, now, again, some of what 
Why are they uh, in the actual implementation as in here seeing the form of the paper or the form of the paper that type class has been removed? And the reason that type class has been removed, I think, although I'm not part of the common part of the discussion, is that there's no reason to make it so constrained uh, a more general type with three parameters here. Yeah. So that the constraint is written in prose at the, uh, the bottom of the slide. Uh, so there is no um, uh, there is no end group with in GHC now. That, that, that library is no longer used in the translation. Uh, and you um, you can plug in so you can plug in the, in the in the comprehension in the middle of the slide on the third line, you can plug in any function. Doesn't have to correspond to any method of the type class. And what are the type restrictions on you doing that? Well, the de sugaring has to be well typed, is what the uh, documentation says. And what does that amount to? Well, it amounts to these conditions here. So that's why, what I mean about it being mysterious. But it turns out I'm going to need this generator. I'm going to need more than this in the shortage so of the question. Is this like what's a bundle? Oh, I have no idea. I've uh, got no Thomas theory. So uh, let me explain the B now. So think that if you have a, um, a collection of values A and you have a way of working out a key B for each value of type A, uh, then this is supposed to group so that in in each sub collection, you have little things with a common B. That's why you need the EQ, for instance. So you can compare your keys with quality, and you can split your values by T. Uh, maybe it has some Thomas theoretic way uh, interpretation, but I don't think it does. So with this, we can solve the problem with uh, equijoins. We can provide an efficient definition of uh, equijoins, like the inputs. So what I'm going to use, um, I'm going to say, so math here is just uh, functions. Uh, math with keys to values is just a function with keys to values. And then the, the table um, from keys to values is a map from keys to bags of values. So it's, a, it's, it's one big bag, but it's partitioned by key. So for each key, you get the sum bag, the sum collection of the, the values in that key. Now I say roughly there, because in order to make this work in Haskell, some new type wrappers and some conversion functions, but this is the, the essence of what's going on. And now I'm going to define two functions, one called merge, one called index by, um, uh, which are going to fulfill the requirements for the, 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 the grouping combination. So what merge does is it takes a, a k index collection of b's and a k index collection of w's and just matches up the, the b's and w's to make a k index collection of the things. So for each k, you get the subcollection of B's for that K and the subcollection of W's for that K, and you form a little Cartesian product on, on, on a given K. And then what index by does is it takes a bag of B's and partitions it into a K index bag of B's. So if you can work out a, a K for each B, and you've got one big bag of B's, you just split it up. And using this merge and this index by, I can now write my Liberty Invoices query uh, as follows. So, uh, again, I draw customer ID, name, address, triples out of customers, and simple invoices out of the invoices table. Um, I do those in parallel to those two vertical bars in this comprehension. So I'm going to use the end zip for the merging thing. Um, and that for each of these um, comprehensions, each of these uh, halves of the parallel, I'm going to integrate um, using index by. Um, so group by customer ID for customers and group by customer invoices. So that'll give me a customer table indexed by customer, in customer ID, and an invoice table indexed by customer ID. And then I merge them, um, and I'll get uh, 
um, all collections of uh, names, collections of addresses, collections of amounts, um, and so this is going to the, the, the names um, and the addresses are hopefully uh, signals and collections because I've hopefully got a single customer with a given customer ID. Uh, and then there's going to be a collection of amounts. So now I'm going to print a, uh, a mailing word letter that says, Dear X, that address Y, you owe me these, these amounts. So this, uh, this avoids expanding the whole Cartesian product of all customers with all inputs. It's only really expanding Cartesian products of customers with inputs with the common customer ID. You only generate the ones you really want. So um, there is a snag, though. Um, uh, so you need, in order to write comprehensions, you need monads. In order to do this indexing, you need maps. In order to do aggregation, which you want to do for the inverse queries, you need finite collections. But finite maps are not a monad. Finite maps are not a monad because the return for maps will be the thing that gives you, for, for any k, that value, that return value, and that will be an infinite map, not a finite map. Uh, so, what can we do about that? Well, here's where another um, ingredient comes in to fill, um, and this paper with Peter Thiemann uh, about the marriage of monads and effects. And um, this idea of combining effects with, uh, with monadic typing, modular monads, um, has inspired some, some recent work, very recent work on graded monads. There's a paper, a paper last week at ETAPS by Shinya Katsumata and two others uh, on, on graded monads. Um, and it's, it's very pretty and it's quite complicated. So I'm going to skip over the, 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 the details. Um, let's say for a monad we have these two operators return and mult. Return makes a singleton collection and mult flattens a collection of collections. Graded monads, what you do is you take that functor t and index it by um, some monad. So now in the, the bottom of the slide t takes two parameters. The first one is the index uh, drawn from some monoid, um, and the second parameter is the, the type parameter. Return um, gives you uh, the unit of the monoid of the index. A multiplication takes a Tm and a, a, a Tm of Tns and As and combines the two indexes together. Um, now, Katamata uh, introduced these for uh, thinking about effects in the, the, in the sense of uh, Peter. Indexing is by collections of effects and collections of effects for the model. A very simple example is with vectors. So here, a thing called the monoid of natural numbers, where the unit is 1 and the binary operator is multiplication. Return takes an A and gives you a vector of length 1 of A's. And mult is the compact that takes a vector of vectors and makes a vector, but it takes a vector of length n and a vector of length n's. Vectors of length n of a's and makes a vector of length n times n of a's. Just like that. Multiplication. Um, so I'm going to use something rather similar to vectors here, but not, not numbers. I'm going to have finite uh, time sequences. So um, table is not a monad. Uh, so finite tables are not a monad. Um, but they are greater than that indexed by sequences of key types. And return gives you the, um, the empty sequence of key types, so in effect gives you the unit type. And uh, merge takes a table indexed by these keys and tables indexed by those keys and uh, concatenates the keys together. So we have to fill indirectly to thank the greater monads too. Greater monads are my new friends. So I'm going to, to finish off uh, with this. Um, these collection monads with a zero and a, a plus, um, Phil called them uh, ringads. And he wrote a little paper called Notes on Monads and Ringads in 1990. Um, and just as monads are monoids and category name functors, ringads are um, right near semi rings in a, in a right near semi ring category because a monoid category. Um, uh, that wasn't Phil's paper, that's, um, that's Tom Wong, his name is but this paper of Phil's um, uh, 
was the size of why a number of other papers in the early 90s on on the of queries and comprehensions and things that have since disappeared and lost to posterity. Phil doesn't have a copy, just didn't have a copy when I asked him. Um, and, and none of the other people I could find had a copy, except one. Um, and Becca Boynton has a very efficient plant system and managed to keep a copy. So this paper has been preserved and uh, has a present uh, um, uh, I've been planning for 44 pages on the um, I'll bring it down. And uh, perhaps you can see, uh, it has a roughly contemporaneous uh, USB stick with the source files. Uh, <laughs> So I just want to say um, that my whole career has been sort of comprehending the things that you've done over the years and uh, 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 somewhat relatedly often took a long time to figure out because I was a structural program and comprehension stuff. Um, but I'm still waiting to figure out how to make the content work for So thank you very much. <laughs> So we're a bit short of time, but I guess we can have one question. how these things form the junction because they're not endocrines anymore. But you can, there is a story of one of the junctions and it's in Katsunaz's Cossack's paper from this year from last week. Um, but that's to say, the junctions are the categorical generalization of downward connections, they're equivalences. And precisely the equivalences can be for all the usual relational database query optimizations arise very sweetly from a, a, an assortment of the junctions. Um, including the free monads and products and all this kind of thing, function spaces, but also this greater monad stuff. Um, so we have a paper um, on Fritz Hengelheim and Ralph Fins and the Nickel School from my humble review at the moment. Um, thanks for having me on this. Okay, cool. Thanks.